All right, so let's start the third lecture. First of all, uh, since I'm uh, changing the gear and changing the subject, let me ask you if you have any questions about the topics we cover so far. I know that uh, during the afternoon you already had some uh, puzzles uh, solved, but uh, this is the last chance. Okay. So the subjects of the remaining uh, lectures will be uh, cosmological perturbations. We want to uh, basically go from A to Z in uh, computing the perturbations that are generated during a sitter period or a period of inflation. I will do it uh, gradually in the sense that uh, we will start with the simplest example and then we will increase the complexity of the computation, but uh, as you will see, it's not uh, really difficult. And in fact, we will use tricks. Uh, I will try to teach you some tricks in order to uh, make the computations as fast as possible. Okay, and if you are not satisfied by these methods, you can go to the lectures note and you can find the complexity there if you like. But of course, since the time is, uh, is finite here, I will try to do some shortcuts and teach you some, um, some useful tricks that you can use. In maybe if you, if you start your career in cosmology, you can uh, learn and, and, and use in the following. Okay? So let's really start from the intuitive uh, um, picture. Okay, so the intuitive picture is the following. So we introduced yesterday a scalar field, which uh, we call the inflaton field. And uh, we discussed only yesterday the background evolution of it, the classical value. So we reduce ourselves to uh, a function of uh, uh, t only, and we call it uh, the classical value or the background value. We discovered that when this field is uh, going down a, a, a potential which is flat enough, it's able to drive inflation, and so on and so forth. We also discussed how inflation ends, how you produce the radiation era, you go through reheating, and so on. Today, uh, we'll start restoring the uh, dependence upon the space. So, in fact, what we will uh, try to understand is how this field is distributed in space and time when inflation is taking place. Okay, so first of all, um, if we write down the Lagrangian, the one that we wrote already yesterday, so we said that uh, this is minus uh, the integral in uh, d4x, the square root of minus g, and then here there is a one half g mu nu d mu phi d nu phi, and since I don't want to go to the other part of the blackboard, I put a minus v of phi here. Sorry, it's a plus with this notation. Okay, so now uh, this uh, scalar field, as we know, uh, satisfies this uh, equation of motion. <coughs> and yesterday we dropped the gradients because we said the function, uh, the inflaton field is only a function of time. But now I want to restore uh, the space dependent and therefore if you use this uh, equation you're going to find something which is in fact phi double dot and here I'm not going to put any more the label zero because now it's uh, the entire scalar field. Okay, so it's the same equation we wrote yesterday, but now I'm going to also restore the gradient parts, in fact the Laplacian, which is there because of course you have to also to account for the fact that uh, the scalar field is also a function of x. Notice in particular that uh, this is the Laplacian with respect to the moving coordinates and therefore there is always a scale factor a here because this gradient or the Laplacian is 1 over the length square and you remember the length, the length scale uh, like the scale factor in an expanding universe. So don't forget this uh, 1 over a square piece here. Okay, so this is the equation that uh, we are going to uh, start from to get at least an intuitive picture. So now <coughs> what I want to do, I want to split 
the field in the following way. I write the phi zero of t, the classical value, plus some uh, fluctuation, which is uh, a function of uh, space and time. Okay. Of course, this splitting is completely arbitrary, um, but uh, we will see that the fluctuations are small. In fact, uh, for most of the lectures, we will do linear perturbation theory. So this uh, splitting, uh, which is correct by itself, also has the meaning that uh, I'm forgetting about higher order terms. Okay, so we will see that uh, delta phi, uh, that the, the, linear, the, the observation tells us that I, we can do linear perturbation theory up to some extent. Okay, so that's the equation. So if I, sp if I insert this uh, splitting here, we get the, the two equations. We, one is the one that we used yesterday many times. Equal to zero. And then of course here, uh, when I use the delta phi, I'm going to expand all the terms. So I'm going to find an equation of the form delta phi double dot plus three h delta phi dot. And here I have minus the Laplacian because the delta phi is a function of um, x as well. Here I have the v prime in this equation, so now I have to expand at first order, so I'm going to get v double prime times delta phi equal to zero. Okay, so those are the two equations that in principle we should be uh, able to solve. Okay? Now, uh, in order to get an intuitive reason why uh, you the perturbations are generated, let me do some, uh, some approximations about uh, on this equation, okay? So those approximations are not very rigorous. I just want to give you the, intu the intuition of what is going on. First of all, <coughs> let me, uh, let me uh, start by uh, assuming that I'm looking at perturbations uh, that are on very long wavelengths. Okay, what does it mean very long wavelengths? It means larger than the Hubble radius during uh, the period of inflation. So I'm looking for the time being only at perturbations that uh, have a l wavelength which is larger, or let's say much larger than the Hubble radius during inflation. Okay, so those are still perturbations. They are not uh, really zero momentum perturbations. They're not really the classical value, but still we are working in this approximation. Why I'm, uh, I'm doing that uh, is because I want to neglect this piece here, the gradient. Because if I take a wavelength, a, a, a perturbation that has a very large wavelength, the gradients will be completely negligible. So I do this approximation just to get rid of this piece. Okay? Because the gradients are small. And once I do it, uh, I can, I can uh, you see, you start seeing that the two equations are very similar, but not yet. So what I do, I do the following. I take one time derivative of the first equation. Yes? Well, first of all, we are in a period of inflation. So I'm, uh, I'm just assuming that uh, we will discuss in uh, detail what is going on. At the we will see that the perturbations are born when the wavelength is smaller than the upper radius. Then, of course, this they are stretched by the expansion of the universe. They go, these wavelengths become larger than the upper radius, and then eventually they will re-enter the horizon much later. So those perturbations that are on super Hubble scales during inflation, eventually, when inflation ends and the, the radiation phase uh, era star starts and the matter, they will re-enter the horizon, and we will observe them as perturbations. Okay. Well, we can observe them only when they are uh, inside our horizon, but of course, during, the during most of the evolution of the universe, they were outside the horizon. Okay, so we have to wait till they enter. They do some dynamics, they s are subject to some dynamics, and then we can measure them in the form of CMB anisotropies or galaxy, galaxy structure, Lasky structure, and so on. But for the time being, we, I'm just looking at the perturbation that during inflation is outside. Okay, but not now, eh? it's just, just during inflation. Okay, so now I take 
I take the, um, the uh, I take the time derivative of this equation, and I'm supposing also that in first approximation the Hubble rate is constant, which we know it's a also a good approximation. So the first equation becomes phi uh, three dots plus three h uh, phi double dot plus here I have to take the derivative with respect to time, and I write it as the derivative with respect to phi times phi dot. Okay. Equal to zero. Okay, so I'm taking h constant as a first approximation, and then I'm taking, I'm looking at this equation. Why I'm doing that? Because now you see, the equation for delta phi and the equation for phi dot is the same. Correct. So if I now interpret this equation as an equation for the variable phi dot zero. You see, this, the equation for this variable and for delta phi is the same, right? Because if I take two derivatives, I get uh, phi triple dots, blah, blah, and then I get the same equation. If I have neglected these uh, gradients, of course, that was my assumption uh, at the beginning. So what does it mean? Since they satisfy the same equation, I can say that the solutions have to be uh, proportional to each other, so I know that uh, a, a very long wavelength perturbation for the field delta phi, I can always write it down as minus phi dot zero, so it has to be proportional to phi dot, and the, the, the constant of proportionality can be a function of space, because there is no space dependent here in those equations, so the space is just an external label. So it's like a constant of proportionality, if you like. But this constant can be a function of space. So from here, I learned that phi of x and t, since phi of x and t is phi 0 plus delta phi of x and t, the splitting that we do before, I can say that this is basically phi 0 of t minus some tau of x. Because when I expand in first order, I will get precisely delta phi to be this. You see? So this means that during the evolution of the universe, if I count for perturbations, what happens is the following, that if I look at different points, my scalar field is going down uh, you know, towards the bottom of its potential, but at different points it will acquire different values. Of course, how much different it depends basically on this quantity tau that we are going to compute. Okay, but this gives you an intuitive uh, picture that you can think of your universe as having at every point the same value of the infraton field up to small uh, fluctuations that we are going to compute in the following. Okay? Is that clear? That basically tells you everything about uh, the perturbations, and now we are going to go into some uh, technical uh, details in order to compute, uh, in order to estimate uh, this picture. But this is very qualitative. Yes, there was a question. Um, <coughs> yes, because I'm expanding in first order. Yes. So this is a, I can think of it as a function of time, where time at the different points is different. So this is the logic I'm doing. But as I said, it's a very rough argument. Uh, I'm uh, able to drop it gra because of, I will have a gradient, but all my arguments is based on the fact that I throw gradients away because I'm looking at long perturbations. So again, I can do it, you see. <coughs> all right, so that was the, that was the intuitive argument. Um, any other question before I proceed? No? All right. So let's uh, <coughs> start. Can I raise here, I guess? Because I'm going to start from, from here. Okay, so now uh, we start from uh, the elementary computation, but this elementary computation is the 
building block of all the cosmological perturbations. So it's something that you should understand quite well, and I will try to go slowly, because once you understand this, you basically have understood almost the, the, the rest. Okay? So what uh, the exercise I want to do now is to compute the perturbation of a massless scalar field in the sitter. Okay? And uh, we will see that once we learn how to compute the perturbation of this, uh, this uh, massless scalar field, basically we are almost done. Okay? So I will try to go by steps and uh, to write down all the details because uh, that is the really, the, as I said, the building block of, uh, of all the computations. Okay, so let's suppose that I have a scalar field. Let me call it uh, chi of x and t. I call it chi because I want to do a generic computation. I, I don't want you to uh, get stick with the idea that I'm using the inflaton field, any scalar field, okay? And in fact, we will use this um, uh, in the, in the, maybe in the last lecture where I will show you how to produce perturbation using a scalar field, which is not the inflaton field. So keep that in mind. The scalar field here is completely generic. And this scalar field has an action that uh, is the one that we already uh, wrote. It's uh, minus uh, one half the integral in uh, d4x square root of minus g uh, times g mu nu d mu chi d nu chi. And this time I don't write down any potential because I want this field to be massless. Okay, so it only has the kinetic term. Okay, so now um, we know very well that uh, the, the equation of motion, as we said before, is the same that I wrote before. Equal to zero. Here uh, there is no mass term, there is nothing, so I have no potential. Okay? Now, uh, this is a quantum field. I can, uh, I can do a Fourier transform of this uh, field. In particular, I I'm going to write down this scalar field as the integral in d3k divided by 2 pi to the power 3 half. Those are my uh, uh, normalizations. e to the minus i k uh, dot x okay, times uh, some function of time here times the, eventually, the annihilation operator plus the emission conjugate. Okay? <coughs> so I'm using these conventions. Uh, in fact, with this convention, I should use the plus. Okay, let's put a plus. It's the same, but never mind. Okay? So once I do this, uh, uh, this um, uh, Fourier transform, um, I also have to impose the usual, uh, the usual commutation relation, so remember that uh, chi prime times uh, chi star minus chi star uh, prime times chi is equal to minus i, okay, because this is a quantum field, so I'm using this, this standard, standard commutation relations, but this is not the important point. The important point is that now I want to write down an equation for the, uh, for the Fourier transform for this field here, okay? But that's easy because the equation, as you see, is linear. The equation tells you that the uh, chi double dot sub k plus 3h chi dot k plus k squared divided by a squared chi sub k is equal to zero. Okay? That is the equation that uh, we are going to use uh, and to elaborate on it a little bit. Okay, so now I replace the Laplacian by the k-square, which is the modulus of the, of the momentum that I'm looking at. Notice that this is a co-moving momentum, and in fact it has a 1 over a dependence when you want, you want to make it physical. Okay? All right, now uh, let's uh, not solve this equation directly. Let's uh, uh, discuss about uh, the different terms. Okay, so this is the question I want to start from. And uh, I will uh, now elaborate about this question. We'll try to understand the physics, and then we will uh, do the mathematics. 
Okay, so during inflation, you have the Abel radius, uh, which is constant. Remember that I'm assuming a pure de Sitter epoch, so H is really constant. We will drop this assumption later on, but uh, so we are going to have H to be a constant. And the Hubble radius during this period of inflation is simply equal to uh, H to the minus 1. Okay, it's fixed. So there is a, um, a sphere of radius H to the minus 1. Okay, and uh, first of all, I'm going to take, uh, so I'm going to take perturbations that are inside the Hubble radius. So I'm looking at lambda much smaller than h to the minus 1. Okay? So what does it mean? Since lambda is basically uh, a divided by k, I'm looking at perturbations that are such that k over a h is much larger than unity. Okay? So this ratio is a fundamental ratio that will tell you if we are looking at perturbation inside or outside the Hubble radius. For the time being, I'm assuming that they are uh, inside. So I have this sphere, and I'm looking at the perturbation whose wavelength is inside the Hubble radius. Okay? Then the equation uh, is um, uh, basically uh, the following. K double dot, you can reduce the equation the following way. Because now, the term which is in the middle, since k is much larger than a over h, can be dropped. Okay? So this equation looks like an equation of an oscillator, uh, with the only problem that, of course, the frequency is uh, time dependence. And in fact, the frequency is, is, is uh, the time dependence is, is uh, rather violent, because the, remember the scale factor goes like an exponential. But this simple uh, approximation tells you that you expect the solution to be a uh, propagating wave. Okay? Let's leave it as it is now. We will elaborate about this uh, comment later on. Now I'm doing the second, uh, the opposite approximation. I'm looking at perturbations that have a wavelength which is much larger than the Hubble radius. And therefore I'm looking at K over AH which is much smaller than unity. Of course, if a perturbation is born inside the Hubble radius, very soon the perturbation will go outside the Hubble radius, the wavelengths will increase by a factor of A, so sooner or later I have to stretch this, uh, this wavelength, and the wavelengths will go outside the Hubble radius. So the situation will be the following. I have H to the minus 1, and then I will have a perturbation that will look like this. Right? I start inside, the, the wavelength is stretched, and, and sooner or later I'm finding myself in this situation. Then the equation of motion, I can, I can uh, simplify it to be this one. I can drop the, uh, the last term, the k squared over a squared, and the equation uh, becomes this. So from here you see very well that the uh, k will be, as a function of time, will be a constant. Okay, so the, as soon as the perturbation leaves the Hubble radius, the wavelength becomes larger than the Hubble radius, then the uh, perturbation will freeze. The amplitude will change, uh, won't change anymore. Okay? So the computation, the goal of the computation is in fact to, uh, to understand what is this amplitude here? Okay, how does it depend on the momentum, or if you like, on the wavelengths, and so on and so forth. What is its amplitude? And this amplitude will tell you something about what we are going to observe at the end of the day. Okay? So this is a, the, the real picture. At the beginning you have, a, where you have an oscillating, uh, um, um, you have a wave, and then uh, the universe is, uh, the scale factor is growing exponentially, the wavelengths will go outside the upper radius, and then the perturbation will freeze. Okay? That is the picture um, we have in, uh, in mind. Okay, now mathematically we want to find the same uh, conclusions uh, in, more, in more detail. Is that clear? Yes. 
When they are equal, this is the moment of what which is called uh, uh, Hubble crossing. And there, uh, okay, there, if, if you want to, to analyze what is going there in this neighborhood, you have to, so you have to solve the equation uh, exactly. Yeah. So, but we will see that this Hubble crossing is in fact very important because once the perturbation go outside the Hubble radius or the wavelength becomes larger, then uh, their amplitude is basically fixed by the value they had at, at Hubble crossing. So that's very important. We'll come back to this point. Other questions? No? Okay, so now I want to, uh, I want to solve this equation exactly. Okay? To do that, I will do some, uh, some change of variables. <coughs> which uh, will... Uh, uh, allow me to simplify the equations and to find the same uh, properties. <coughs> okay, so first of all, it's uh, very convenient in uh, the computations for the sitter to introduce, uh, to change the uh, time label. Okay, so remember that our metric that we, st we always start from is minus dt square plus the scale factor, which is a function of time, times dx squared. Okay? Now we are going to introduce a, uh, a conformal time. Which is defined by the relation d tau equal to dt over a. Okay? So in this, uh, in this coordinates, uh, what happens is that my, my metric becomes a square of tau times minus d tau square plus uh, dx square. And you understand why uh, it's called conformal time? Because, of course, the metric is simply conformal to Minkowski, as you see. You remember that the metric is conformal to another metric with when they are related by a, a, a common factor in front, okay? which is exactly the case here. All right, so now, uh, first of all, well, the first exercise we have to do is to compute the scale factor uh, in terms of the function tau. This is trivial, let's do this computation, because we know that a of t goes like some, uh, let's, let's put some a star, e to the h times t minus t star, let's say, something like this. So I have that uh, tau, so I have d tau equal to dt over a. From here, I learned that the tau minus some uh, initial, some tau initial value, whatever it is, it's e is the integral uh, up to the time t in uh, dt over, uh, over a. Okay, so if you want to put a ti here, <coughs> okay. But uh, remember that uh, this is a scale factor, so from here, uh, what you get, you get minus 1 over h times e to the minus h uh, star times t minus uh, t star, we decide to do, okay? And, um, and there is also uh, an a star, which I, put, uh, I, pu I can put it here, okay? Which is evaluated between ti and t, okay? Sorry, there is also a parenthesis. Okay, so from here, uh, you see that I have 1 over a when I evaluated time t. Okay, so I identified, if you fix the boundary condition in a, in a, in a proper way, I, I can identify the tau as minus 1 over h a, which comes from the first piece here, there is a minus sign. So I can find that a in a conformal time is minus 1 over h tau, okay? Where, again, I have fixed some uh, constants here in an in a, in a, uh, appropriate way. And notice in particular that in this scale factor, uh, the tau is negative, okay? So the end of inflation happens when tau is equal to 0, when a goes to infinity. And the beginning of inflation is some period uh, uh, tau, some time tau, where tau goes to minus infinity. Okay? So in these coordinates, uh, the you don't get an exponential anymore. You just get a, a scale factor that looks like this, and tau is negative. 
All right. <coughs> so that was uh, the first uh, uh, piece of transformation we want to do. And the second one, so I leave it, I leave it there. The second uh, uh, transformation I want to do is to <coughs> rewrite my scalar field in the following way. <coughs> so first of all, let's, uh, let's uh, compute what is the action of the scalar field chi in these coordinates. So let me rewrite minus one half the integral in uh, the uh, let's, let's time, this time I write it d3x d tau. Okay, so I have the square root of minus g, but the square root of minus g now is the, the minus g is a to the eighth, square root is a to the four. Okay, and then I have g mu nu times uh, d mu chi d nu chi, and this becomes minus one half the integral in uh, d three x d tau a to the four. Now, what is the inverse of the metric? I have, uh, I have, um, uh, okay, I, I erase it. It's a square in front of everything, so the inverse is one over a. The inverse is one over a square, so I have an a square here, and then here, if I cancel the minus one, I put a plus one. I have simply chi dot square minus uh, the grad of chi square. Okay, so you see from here I get plus one, well, let's put a one half inside. So integral in d4x of uh, a square times one half of chi dot square minus the grad of chi uh, square divided by two. Okay, this is the, 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 the Lagrangian in this case. Notice in particular that uh, doing this transformation I cancel the one over a square here which you already you see that it's convenient because that one, one over a square was was uh, making computation more difficult. So let's let's continue with this. Okay. All right. Now the second passage I want to make is to define, in fact, my scalar field chi of x and t. I define it to be another scalar field. Let me call it sigma. Divide by a. Okay. It looks uh, a, a, a simple uh, thing, but uh, it will be very useful, as we'll see. Okay, so let me call now the new scalar field sigma, whatever. Okay? Okay, so I wanted to rewrite the Lagrangian uh, for this uh, new scalar field sigma. So the first thing I have to do is to compute the chi dot. The chi, sorry, now uh, I, I made a mistake. In fact, since now I'm changing time, this dot, I want to uh, call it uh, prime, okay? I call it prime because I want to distinguish between the dot that was a time derivative, sorry. The dot here in this uh, was meant to be the derivative with respect to tau, but I don't want to confuse you, so I put a prime, okay? Sorry about that. So the chi prime is what? Is equal to sigma prime divided by a minus sigma uh, a prime divided by a square. Okay, <coughs> all right, let's change blackboard uh, because I don't want to make a mess. So now I'm going to write down only uh, the, well, let's write down all the action. So the whole action will be, this time is a function, uh, the fun it's for the f uh, field uh, sigma. It's going to be the integral in d4x. So I had an, S an a square at the, uh, at the, be at the beginning. I can also put uh, the two in front of everything. Uh, and then I have what? I have sigma prime uh, square uh, divided by a square. So I'm taking the square of uh, this relation here. Okay? Then I have plus sigma square uh, a prime divided by a square. Then I have minus two uh, sigma prime sigma times a prime divided by uh, a cube. And then I have the gradient term, which is minus the grad of sigma square divided by a square. Okay. Uh, where? 
On the second term, I have also the second term. I have the square. Ah, sorry. Yes, it's uh, one over a square. Yes, I forgot to write. Okay. Very well. So that's it. Okay. So now uh, I rewrite this term as the derivative with respect to sigma square. So let me. Uh, how should I do it? I, I write in uh, in. Uh, with the green. Okay, so this is equal to minus the derivative of sigma square prime, okay, times uh, a prime over a cube. Okay, is that clear what I'm doing? I don't want to rewrite everything. Hmm? All right. So, so far so good. This is uh, with the minus sign. And then you see I can integrate by parts. Uh, well, sorry, before doing that, I want to simplify further my, my Lagrangian because you see I can eliminate a lot of uh, terms. So let's, let me rewrite it, okay? It's better to, to eliminate the A square in front. So now the Lagrangian becomes uh, S of sigma. is equal to uh, integral in d4x divided by 2. And here I have, so the a square a square goes away, so I have sigma prime square. Okay. Then I have the a square that goes away from here, so I have plus sigma square which multiplies a prime over a square. Then I have minus the derivative of sigma uh, square uh, times what? Times uh, the a square gets um, um, annihilated with a cube, and I'm left with a prime over a. Okay? And here I have minus the grad of uh, sigma square. All right? Let me check to see if I have uh, lost anything. No, it's okay. All right, so now I integrate by parts this thing, okay? So I'm uh, integrating by parts this thing. So integrate by parts. So I'm going to get the integral in d4x divided by 2, sigma prime uh, square plus a sigma square uh, a prime over a uh, square. I integrate by parts, so I change the sign, so I have plus sigma square a double prime divided by a, and here I have minus uh, sigma square uh, a prime uh, square divided by a square, which is the derivative of 1 over a, and then I have minus the grad of sigma square. Okay? So now you see that uh, this piece goes away with this. And finally, my Lagrangian for this uh, scalar field <coughs> looks like the following. It is one half the integral in uh, d4x. I have simply uh, something which looks like a simple oscillator in Minkowski, but not completely. Okay, so this is the final uh, action that uh, I want to start from uh, to analyze the perturbations. Okay, so you see this action is an action of a scalar field that has a mass term, uh, but the mass term is time dependent. Okay, because remember that uh, the scale factor goes like minus 1 over tau, so derivatives and so on, so it will be time dependent. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, now, if I write down the equation of motion for this scalar field, what I do, I do the Fourier transform. First of all, I go to a momentum space, and I want to see how this equation looks like. Can I raise here? I guess you, the no, in any case, the notes contain this uh, detail, so you don't have to worry too much about if you lost something along the way. <coughs> Okay, so now uh, I go to momentum space. Uh, 
And the equation for the perturbation in momentum space looks like this. Sigma double prime uh, k plus uh, k square minus uh, a double prime over a times sigma k equal to zero. Okay? The k square comes from the gradients, from the Laplacian, when I write down the equations and so on. Okay? So let's compute this object here, first of all. Um, in fact, let's compute first uh, this famous ratio k over a h. Okay, that was discriminating between uh, having a wavelength which is inside or outside the upper radius. In conformal time, this object becomes k divided by a, um, which is minus 1 over h uh, tau, we said, times h. So you see the h goes away, so it's minus k tau. Okay? Remember there is a minus sign because tau is negative. All right. So first of all, I have this uh, quantity. Second of all, what is A prime? Since A is minus 1 over H tau, A prime is equal to 1 over H uh, tau square, and A double prime is equal to uh, minus uh, 2 divided by H tau cube, in such a way that if I want to compute this ratio, this ratio is A double prime divided by A, is equal to minus 2 divided by h uh, tau cube times the inverse, so which is nothing else than minus h uh, tau. So the h goes away, and I have 2 divided by tau square. Okay? So this equation becomes sigma double prime of k plus k square minus 2 divided by tau square, sigma k equals 0. Okay? All right. Now let's uh, try to see what happens uh, when uh, I'm inside or outside the upper radius. So let's uh, discriminate again the two cases. So the first case, we said we want a, a wavelength which is much larger, sorry, much smaller than the Hubble radius. We said that this corresponds to k over a h uh, much larger than unity, and therefore to minus k tau much larger than unity. Okay, so the situation is the one that I drew before. I have my sphere of radius h to the minus 1. I'm looking at the perturbation which is inside the uh, Hubble radius. But if it is inside the Hubble radius as minus k tau is much larger than unity, you see, when I look at this equation, it's clear what is going on. I can neglect the second piece in the parentheses, and I keep only the first one. Okay? So in this case, the equation is simply sigma double prime k plus k squared sigma k equal to zero. And you see now the advantage of making all this uh, time uh, redefinition, also the field redefinition, because now the equation of motion is really an equation for a wave. Before there was a 1 over a square that was complicating things, but doing these uh, changes, it simplifies the physics. Okay? On the other side, um, when we look at perturbations which are much, um, sorry, which are much um, um, larger than the Hubble radius, again I'm looking at k over h which is much more than unity, and therefore I'm looking at minus k tau much more than unity. And in this case, I can drop the, uh, I can drop the k square with respect to the 1 over tau square, and the equation of motion becomes sigma double prime uh, equal to a double prime a, let me rewrite again with the a, times sigma. Okay? I can rewrite this equation the following way. Uh, sigma double prime k divided by sigma k is equal to a double prime divided by a. And therefore, from here, I discover that sigma k goes like the scale factor. Okay? It grows like the scale factor. But now remember that chi was sigma over a. And therefore, chi, which is sigma over a, the given mode will be will go to a constant 
which is exactly what we were uh, discussing before. Okay, but in this new scalar field, it goes like the scale factor. Okay, and of course here we are in a situation where uh, the, the, we are very much, you know, larger than the wavelength is much larger than the Hubble radius. Okay. Okay, again, this is very qualitative. Now let's go to the solution. In fact, before going to the mathematical solution, let me tell you, uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit um, some tricks and some, uh, some considerations. So let's have a look, first of all, at the regime where man minus k tau is uh, much larger than unity. Okay, so we said the equation is sigma double prime k plus k squared sigma uh, k equal to zero. Okay, so now uh, you said the solution of this equation is, uh, is quite simple. You say that sigma uh, sub k of tau is some uh, constant um, a1, let's put it, divided by the square root of 2k e to the minus i k tau plus some other constant a2 e to the i k tau um, divided by the square root of 2k, where the square root of 2k, I put it because I want a normalized uh, wave. Okay? So, inside the Hubble radius, when the perturbation is born, uh, the, the, it behaves really like a wave, propagating wave. But the first question I have to ask myself is, how do I choose about these coefficients? Okay? Because, in principle, I have complete freedom to choose A1 and A2, as, uh, which are numbers, as, as I like. Well, it turns out that the, the, the way you choose, uh, so the, the basically selecting the values of A1 and A2 is equivalent to select your initial uh, vacuum state. Okay? Now, if I, uh, if I, now I there is no logic, no rationale, which is better than any other, but uh, in general, what we do is to, uh, to, to choose the coefficients. We say that we want to, st to start with initial vacuum state, which, has, which minimizes the energy of the system, which has zero particle in it, okay? Which is called uh, the Bunch-Davis vacuum. The Bunch-Davis vacuum is the one that minimizes the, the energy of the system and amounts to say that A1 is equal to 1 and A2 is equal to 0. Okay? You can prove that if you compute the Hamiltonian of, your, uh, of the system with a scalar field, you compute the expectation value of it, you can show that if you choose uh, if you expect the commutation relation and if you choose uh, your, um, your solution like plane waves, you can show that the one that minimizes the energy is this choice here. Of course, you can say, I know nothing about the beginning of inflation. The, it might well be that during, uh, at the beginning of inflation, the universe is filled of particles. Okay, so you can choose another vacuum and people People also, some people like to do it, which is perfectly um, uh, allowed. But the simplest case is this one, and I'm going to proceed with this one. Okay? In any case, people have shown that the, if you choose another vacuum, since uh, you know, inflation is taking place and so on, the impact on the final observations is not really huge. In fact, it's almost negligible, so we will work under this assumption. Okay, so from now on, I will take my solution to be in the, in the ultraviolet, uh, when the perturbation are, have wavelengths much smaller than the upper radius, I will take this vacuum here, this solution. Okay? Very well. <coughs> so now, um, on the other side, when I'm on the, uh, on the, on the opposite regime, when I'm the opposite regime, I can uh, say that, uh, so when I have the uh, minus k tau much uh, large, so much more than one, okay, I can say that my sigma k of tau is some function b of k, okay, some uh, number, uh, which is a function of k times a, because th this is the, the equation, the solution of this equation, okay. 
Notice that I'm talking, uh, of course, the solution, I mean, there are two solutions. One is because it's a second order differential equation, but I'm, dro I'm dropping the decaying mode. I'm only taking the growing mode here. Okay? So that is the, so how do I fix B of K? Well, there is a very rough way to fix uh, B of K, saying that the two solutions have to match when, uh, when minus K tau is equal to, uh, to 1. Okay? This is a very rough. But let's do it, because it tells you something. In fact, when the problem is more difficult than this, sometimes you encounter computational perturbation which is much uh, more involved than this. Doing the matching at the Hubble crossing is quite useful to, uh, to s say something about the physics. So right now I'm doing the, um, the matching. OK? And the matching tells me that I have to impose that I take the matching for the modulus. So I have 1 over the square root of 2k has to be equal to uh, b uh, k times a at the time where k divided by a h, which is the horizon, uh, the Hubble crossing, is equal to 1. OK? Remember that minus k tau is equal to k over a h. Okay, so if I do this uh, simple and uh, rough uh, estimate, I can find the coefficient b of k that will tell me the, um, the amplitude of the perturbations. Okay, so if I use this relation, I get 1 over the square root of 2k. This is equal to b uh, times a but A, I, I get it from here, is uh, K over H, okay? So from here, I get that B of K is nothing as an H over the square root of 2 K cube, okay? So when I'm looking at perturbations, which are on superable scales, the, the, let's go back to the, f to the initial scalar field chi that was defined to be sigma k over a. So what I learned is that when I'm looking at perturbations that which are, um, whose wavelength is uh, much smaller than the Hubble radius, my, my scalar field has a, has a, is a constant. So now I drop the a because I divide it, but I do the matching, and then I get this is the result, is h over the square root of 2 k cube. I'm taking the two solutions and I'm gluing them. Okay? You will see, I can find, I will tell you what uh, the exact solution is, don't worry. This is very rough, but in fact you get the correct result. Okay, so the most important piece of information is here. As expected, when I look at perturbation which, uh, are, whose wavelength is much larger than the horizon, okay, they are constant, first of all, as promised at the beginning of the lecture. First of all, there is no evolution because remember the h in this approximation is constant. And the amplitude is fixed by the momentum, that by the corresponding wavelengths, moving wavelengths, and it goes like the square root of uh, 1 over k cube. Okay? This is the result that you get from these symbol uh, arguments. All right? So I think we can take a break uh, of a few minutes, and then we will solve the equation exactly and get the same results, okay? And uh, we will elaborate about this, all right? So let's take, uh, so how much time I have to, till 11, uh, 11 or 11.15, no, 11. Ten forty five or ten so if I do the break ten forty five. If I don't do the break ten thirty. <laughs> right? I should be done by let's take uh, five minutes, okay, and then we will continue.
fino ai 45 allora, no? Ai 45. Okay. Let's start. All right, let's uh, start and finish this business. So, okay, so let me, fa let me summarize the results. So we started from a scalar field, okay, and we discovered that once we do the uh, Fourier transform of this uh, scalar field, we discovered that uh, when the mode goes out of the uh, Hubble radius, this uh, scalar field chi okay, has the following uh, fundamental result is h over square root of 2 uh, k cube okay in fact uh, i want to now show that uh, this is uh, also coming out from solving exactly the, the equations so you remember um, there is this uh, sigma double prime of k plus k square minus 2 divided by tau square sigma k equals to 0 okay now you can solve this equation exactly and I want to solve it with the boundary condition that my sigma k of tau when uh, minus k tau is much larger than unity has to go to e to the minus i k tau divided by the square root of uh, 2 uh, k Okay, so I solve it because I choose the bunch Davis vacuum. So you can solve exactly this equation with this boundary condition. You can show that sigma k of tau is in fact equal to e to the minus i k tau divided by the square root of 2k times 1 minus i k uh, divided by k tau. So this is exact the exact solution. Okay. As you can see, when k tau uh, with the minus sign is much larger than unity, I can drop this term and then I get a plane wave. When I'm working in the opposite regime, the solution goes like 1 over tau, which you remember is the scale factor. And sigma was going like the scale factor, so you get uh, the thing. But you see, uh, when I want to compute the, um, the solution on uh, wavelengths which are much larger than the uh, Hubble radius, so when minus k tau is much more than unity, if you compute the, the modulus of the solution when you multiply by a, you are going to get exactly this, uh, for the chi field, exactly this thing. So in, in this case, the, the, the matching that I do, um, when if I want not to solve the equation exactly, and sometimes you don't know the analytical solution when you have prob uh, some problems which are more problematic, then uh, you, you do the matching and you, you know, sometimes the matching works. In this case, it works even uh, perfectly, okay? But this is the, the, the bottom line. You get this amplitude, okay? Constant and goes like 1 over k cube. Now, we are going to define an object, which is a fundamental object, is the power spectrum, okay? Which, by definition is the power spectrum, let's say, of the, phi of the chi field as a function of k, is by definition k cube divided by 2 pi square times the modulus of uh, the mode square. Okay? So this is a power spectrum. Where this definition comes from? It comes from the computation of the variance. Suppose that I, I want to compute the variance of the scalar field chi. Okay, like you do when you have an harmonic os oscillator. So if I go to momentum space, uh, this integral, I can, I can do the sum over all the momenta. So I get this object here, the integral in D4K, D3K, sorry, time divided by 2 pi cube times the modulus of uh, the field square. Okay. Now, uh, I can do, since this guy does not depend on the orientation, because of course uh, we are not breaking isotropy and so on, so I can rewrite this uh, thing as the integral in uh, uh, dk over k times, um, times k cube divided by 2 pi square times the modulus of uh, 
the field chi sub k square. So what I have done here, I split the d free k, I have done the integral over the angles, this gives me a 4 pi. A 4 pi divided by 2 pi cubed gives me the 2 pi square. I multiply up and down by k in such a way to have the k square, I want to have the k cube. And I have an integration over the d log k here. Okay, so you see, this is nothing else than by definition the integral of d log k of the power spectrum. Okay, so the variance is nothing else than the integral over the logarithmic uh, uh, variable k of the power spectrum. So I have this definition, it comes from there, physically. Okay, so what is the power spectrum of the perturbation that I've been generating for a simple scalar field, massless, in the sitter? I learned that the power spectrum is what? Is 1 over uh, 2 pi square k cube times the square of this object. So is h square divided by 2 k cube. The k cube goes away and I have h over 2 pi square. So this is a fundamental result which we are going to use all the time in the following. It tells you that for a massless scalar field in exact the sitter, exponential growing of the scale factor, the power spectrum of the fluctuations when they are on super Hubble scales, okay, so here I just want to be sure that we understand each other. This is for minus k tau much more than unity. So I'm looking at the perturbation when they, have already con they are already constant which is a good thing because, of course, I don't have to care about the time dependence. This power spectrum is independent of the momenta, of the wavelengths, and its amplitude is fixed by the only energy scale I have in the problem, which is the Hubble rate. Okay, this h over 2 pi sometimes is also called the hawking gibbons temperature, and uh, it's a fundamental object that you will encounter all the time in the sitter. Okay? We say that this power spectrum is flat. So this is a flat power spectrum, where flat in this case means that it does not depend on the wavelengths. Okay? Every time a given uh, fluctuation is going outside the Hubble radius, and any time I compute their power spectrum, this power spectrum is just h over 2 pi all the time. Okay? So we call it a flat power spectrum. All right? Very well. So now, uh, in fact, let me elaborate a little bit about this. <coughs> in general, if you have a power spectrum, you might think of it as some uh, amplitude, which you fix at some scale k star, times Let's parameterize this power spectrum in this way, okay? And you put some uh, factor n minus 1 here, okay? We say that uh, you, you it's a good approximation uh, most of the time to parameterize the power spectrum as a power law. And this n is called the spectral index, okay? Now, we just discovered, using this definition, that the power spectrum of a massless scalar field in the sitter has spectral index equal to 1. So this is for a massless field in the sitter. Okay? So the spectral index of a mass scalar field is equal to 1, and the corresponding power spectrum is flat. It does not uh, depend on the momenta. And uh, it's also called the Ariston's Zeldovich spectrum because um, by historical reasons. OK? All right. Yes. Yes, for the power spectrum, yes. There is uh, equal power to all the frequencies for all the wavelengths, yes. Oh, that's a good question. So, 
Uh, it will take hours to, to answer this question. In the sitter, in pure the sitter, when you have a massive scalar field, uh, you know, when you compute the, you know, the fluctuations of the scalar field, the variance, it's, uh, you get infrared divergences, the d, dk over k, yes. So then, uh, I mean, uh, the, the question is, uh, what is the back reaction in pure the sitter of this, you know, very long wavelength mode? I mean, there is a lot of debate about that. Uh, luckily for us, inflation is not exactly the sitter, so, you know, the situation is not the same, it's not as problematic, but uh, people are debating about this. It's very, that's a very, very interesting problem because some people say that, for instance, the sitter will uh, not last uh, eternally because of, of the feedback of these uh, infrared modes, for instance, yes. So, I mean, there is a lot of discussion about it. So it's a non-trivial question, what you're asking. And just a clarification, the X is uh, happening during inflation, right? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's a during inflation. Uh, today is, uh, I mean, today we are accelerating, but uh, it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, right. So let's now do uh, one step, let's take one step ahead and uh, let's discuss what happens when I release the assumption which I'm in pure the sitter. Okay? Uh, so I want to do the computation now in the, real, in the more realistic case in which inflation is taking place, so the, it's not exactly the sitter, but uh, the harbor rate is changing with time, slowly, but it does change, okay? Because that is a physical situation that I have to, um, to deal with. Okay, so the qu the I have two ways to do it. First way is the complicated way, F the other way is, is the shortcut uh, way, and I will start with the letter, okay? And I will try to reproduce in a more complicated way, if I have time, the, 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 the same result, but in a, in a, in a more uh, slightly more complicated way. Okay, so just to be clear, I want to uh, solve now the problem in which uh, the Hubble rate is changing with time. So I'm solving the following problem. I take a massless scalar field. In quasi the sitter. Let me define it in, in this way, quasi the sitter. Meaning the realistic case in which the Hubble rate is changing slowly with time according to the equation H dot equal to minus epsilon h square. You remember yes, yesterday I defined this epsilon to be precisely minus h dot divided by h square. And I also want to do it by taking epsilon to be constant. If you remember we discussed yesterday, epsilon is a very small number during inflation. Its variation with time, they go like epsilon square, so I can neglect them. Okay, so I'm working at first order in epsilon. Okay, so in principle what I should do is to uh, find the scale factor in this particular case, find the equation of motion for the sigma, solve it, and find the power spectrum for the chi, right? This is the same, uh, the same uh, path that uh, I've been um, doing uh, for the, the sitter case, I should do the following. But um, since we don't have so much time, I will, I will teach you a trick, okay? What is the, 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 the physics behind this assumption? The physics is the following. Look at uh, the perturbations. So we have a, a period of inflation where, okay, let's do it like this. Okay, then inflation ends. This is the Hubble radius. And then we have a perturbations that is growing like a scale factor, so here this is lambda, is really the wavelength of the perturbation, the physical wavelength. It is born here, okay, where the wavelength is much more than the Hubble radius, then it is stretched by the factor of A, it goes very soon outside the Hubble radius, it stays a long, long time outside the Hubble radius, and finally at some epoch during the evolution of the unit, it re-enters 
our horizon and it becomes observable okay now I drew this line here on purpose with a tilt because I'm now re um, I'm now um, uh, releasing the hypothesis that the Hubble rate is constant and since the Hubble rate is solving this equation during the during the real period of inflation the Hubble rate goes down with time and therefore the Hubble radius is slightly increasing with time so that's the reason why I drew this thing a little bit tilted okay but of course I exaggerate it because epsilon is very small so the tilt is very small but what I'm s looking at is let's draw another wavelength okay so when the Hubble, so we learned uh, a few uh, minutes ago that in order to compute the, the, the amplitude of the perturbations when the wavelength leaves the Hubble radius, I can do the matching at Hubble radium crossing here, at this point and at this point. Okay? So at these two points, the Hubble uh, rate is not exactly the same but the difference is very small okay so suppose that I, I redo the computation and I do the following things I take H to be constant and then at the end of the computation I remember that in fact H is not exactly constant but the value it depends on the momentum or the wavelengths when the wavelength is going outside the upper radius so what is going to be the power spectrum of this uh, scalar field okay that um, massless is going to be the power spectrum of this scalar field is going to be the same as before h over 2 pi square but here I have to be careful I have put a label k here which is there to remind me that I have to put here the value of the upper rate when the given wavelength or momentum k the inverse of the momentum is going outside the upper radius okay very well so the amplitude you see is still h over 2 pi but now i would expect a dependence on the uh, on the momentum k on the spectral index so the power law is not exactly uh, n is not exactly one it is is going to be slight different from one let's compute it okay so how do I compute it remember that the power spectrum I define to be some a of k star times uh, some power law k divided by k star to the power n minus 1 okay so how do I define the n minus 1 from here n minus 1 is simply the derivative of the log of P divided by uh, the log of K right this is the definition of the spectral index now let's do this computation you will see it's not uh, difficult uh, I think I'm going to erase here okay so I write I have to do so n k n minus 1 is equal to the derivative of the log of the power spectrum with respect to the log of k okay this is nothing as the derivative of the log of the Hubble uh, um, rate square but here I put a label k divided by d log k okay but I rewrite this derivative in a, in a, in a more complicated way but uh, more physical so I will say that this is the derivative of this and then I divide I, div I derive with respect to time t then I say times dt over d log a times d log a divided by d log k okay all right so now we have to compute three derivatives but those are trivial so I do the following so what is the first one the first one is 
2. So I have 2. Then I have 1 over h, because it's a log, times h dot. OK? OK. Then I have dt over d log a, which is, um, uh, when I take the inverse, it is um, uh, 1 divided by h. OK? And then what is this thing? This thing is 1. Why? Because I compute the power spectrum uh, at Hubble crossing. So at Hubble crossing, I have k over a h equal to 1. OK? Because I know that from that point on, the perturbation remains constant. So I, if I take the d log of uh, d log a divided d log a, since h is constant, I get 1. OK? So what is this thing? This thing is, now it's at the crucial point, h is roughly constant. The derivative goes like epsilon. So here, I can, I can neglect the k dependence because I'm working at the first order in approximation. So I get minus 2 epsilon. OK? <coughs> Which epsilon is the epsilon where the given mode is going outside the Hubble radius, of course. So I get that n minus 1, well, I get that n is equal to 1 minus 2 epsilon. OK? What I discover, therefore, is that in the realistic period of inflation, which is not the sitter, but the Hubble rate is going down with time because inflation has to end at some point, I discover a fundamental result that the spectral index is not equal to 1. It, is, it deviates from unity, but very little. OK? And you start seeing now uh, the beauty of this uh, result. Of course, we will elaborate f uh, more in the, in the following. So, so you, you see, in the, in the case of the perturbations that we measure through the CMB anisotropies or through the, well, basically through the CMB anisotropies, uh, we will define the spectral index of a gauge invariant quantities starting from tomorrow and so on. Okay? So, we, we will define a quantity that can be related directly to the measurements. Of this quantity, we will, com of this quantity, we will compute the power spectrum, and we will compute the uh, spectral index. The spectral index is, going s is something that you can measure. Okay? And uh, it's measured to be of order of point, point, uh, 0 0.96. Okay? So something extremely close to 1, but not exactly one. So you see here, you start seeing the sign of it. You see here in this simple computation for a scalar field, you see the same properties. A spectral index which is close to one, but not exactly one. But not zero free. Something very close to one, so because the epsilon is small in this case. So you already start seeing uh, how to uh, interpret the data that um, we will discuss uh, later on, how to interpret in terms of theoretical predictions. You see? You say, so once you understand this computation, the computation of the more complicated observable linked to the, uh, linked to the real observations and so on will be basically based on this simple thing. If you understand this, you have understood basically most of it. OK? Yes. Say it again. Yes. So. Ah, yes. For this, uh, for this uh, particular case, uh, yes. Because it's even uh, more infrared than before. Yeah. In this case, yes. But then, of course, when uh, you have, uh, you know, you you deal with the real case of inflation. First of all, inflation has a beginning, so it's, you cannot take, uh, you know, all the modes. So there is an infrared cutoff. And of course, the question is, uh, are those, then the real question is, are those wavelengths that uh, are outside the Hubble radius physical or not? So there is a lot of discussion about that. I, I don't have time to go into these details, but uh, we can discuss in the afternoon if you want. <coughs> okay. So this is a, a key result that, um, uh, that, um, 
I think we, you should get the you know you should get the meaning of because that is one of the fundamental predictions of inflation, not for this particular case of a massive scalar field, but we were, we are going to get something very similar tomorrow. Okay. Okay. So now uh, in the remaining time, uh, I was supposed to in fact show you how to get this result in a in a um, longer way, doing the precise computation. But that will take me more than a few minutes, so I think I should stop here, maybe. And then uh, we will resume this computation tomorrow. And maybe I can ask some questions mean, meanwhile. You have a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but it's this not this case. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Th there is another quantity which uh, is called the, uh, you know, the commoving covert superturbation that we are going to define tomorrow of which you compute the power spectrum, you compute the spectral index, and it's going to be, uh, if I'm going to derive a formula very similar to this, and then you can measure this quantity, and it's uh, about 0.96 or something. Yeah, yeah, so in that case, yeah, yeah, because you can define, yes, you can of course do the same exercise, compute the two-point correlator, of uh, the fluctuations, and uh, there you will see that uh, they are defined in the same way by uh, momentum conservation, of course. So you can compute the average of uh, chi k1, chi k2, and that is, okay, the, the Dirac delta of k1 plus k2 times the power spectrum and so on, so you can do the same uh, thing. Yes, 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 yes. So that will be the, the, the goal of the next lectures to find an observable uh, during inflation, compute its power spectrum, compute its spectral index related to the temperature isotropies that you measure, go back and make the, the, the check if the prediction is correct or not. That will be the path that I will be using. Yes. I think we have time maybe for one extra question or curiosity. <coughs> Okay, so I think I'll stop here, and I'll see you tomorrow. Okay.